Uh, this morning I left the house without my Bible. So today I had to go to my office, which is next door, which is really not an office because I'm never in my office. It has a desk in it that is not really a desk. It becomes a desk if I need it to be a desk. And in it can, is contained perhaps one of my oldest Bibles that I bought myself, which is the Jerusalem Bible, and it weighs like 7 million tons. So it's rare that I preach out of the uh, Jerusalem Bible because it is not lightweight. Uh, however, today we're going to experience the stretch, at least I'm going to be stretched, in holding a heavy Bible. Today we're looking at of all the visioning uh, pieces that I could look at, I kept coming back to a piece that sounds like it's not about vision at all. Uh, you know, there are wonderful pieces in Jeremiah and the prophets. There are some other pieces about vision that appear throughout the biblical text. And yet, for me, it kept coming back to love. I'm sorry, that's just the only thing that it kept coming back to for me, that visioning has to grow out of love. So I'm going to share with you why I think that's so, but clearly in the first letter of John, uh, the writer thinks the exact same thing. Uh, beginning in chapter 4 of the first letter to John uh, and the seventh verse, um, Beloved, let us love one another since love comes from God. And everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Anyone who fails to love can never have known God because God is love. Beloved, since God has loved us so much, we too ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God but as long as we love one another, God will live in us and his love will be complete in us. This is a word from the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as I thought about the passage this morning, first of all, you start talking about love. Can we just be honest with each other? That is just the most overused word ever. Everyone loves everything all the time. And if you ask me the right question at the right time, uh, I can answer it in some kind of way related to love. Yesterday morning, Joshua comes downstairs because the birds, we, we sleep with the windows open when it's in between seasons, and Joshua comes downstairs, poor Joshua. He has been awakened at 5 a.m. by the birds outside his window. And uh, he is slightly disgruntled by that uh, uh, because he got in late. I don't even know exactly what time he got in. He is 22 years old, so he can come in when he wants to come in, uh, more or less. Um, but uh, So I didn't hear him come in. But if you come in after I've gone to bed and then you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning because of the loud singing bird outside your window, you probably are just a tad bit irritated. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't speak for everybody. I actually like to be awakened by the birds at 5 o'clock in the morning, and so I said, Josh, imagine this with me for just a moment. And, and this is, look, how many times have I told you, don't say stupid things to people who are irritated, you know, or sad or anything. Don't just give some kind of magical answer. But I don't always take my own advice. So I tried to give what I thought was a loving response in that moment. It was not particularly a loving response. I said, now, God, I said, now, Josh, here's what I want you to do. Josh, you be Josh for a moment, and I'll be God. And imagine that I am everywhere all the time in the universe, and I'm watching everything. But in this moment, as I'm watching that beautiful dream you're having, I just want to be closer to you. I want you to wake up. I want to see your eyes open and feel alive. And I want to sing a song of beautiful love to you about how much I love you and want to be close to you. So I kind of send my spirit upon that bird right outside your window. And I stir that bird up to sing you a beautiful love song to wake you up in the morning just so you'll know I love you. And Josh looked at me while I said, 
you be Josh and I'll be God. And immediately right there, there was probably immediate disconnect because he knows better. He's lived with me for, you know, 22 years. But the other was my disconnect because I didn't choose the most loving response by simply saying, Josh, it is irritating to be awakened earlier than you planned on being awakened. That's just the way that it is sometimes. I'm sorry. I could have said the right thing, but instead, I was in one of those moments, you know, those moments when I think I've got the loving answer. And sometimes the loving answer isn't the loving answer. Sometimes my loving answer isn't your loving answer. And when we start to think about what it really means for us to be church, it really boils down to love. Jesus said the two great commandments, love God and love your neighbor. And love God all the way and love your neighbor with all that you are. And if you can do that, if you can be that love in the community you find yourself, the world will be changed. If we can be love at St. James, the West End will be changed. It might not be changed in ways we can see. Some ways we can see. Let me tell you what, part of love at St. James is partnering with St. Joseph's Catholic Church and Church of the Resurrection Episcopal Church who, and Alive and providing a food pantry right next door so that every Monday night, hungry people on the west end of Alexandria can experience love in the form of food so that they're not hungry. Or at least so that their pantry is slightly fuller than it would have been otherwise. Now you might say, that's food, James. That's not love. If you're hungry, food is love. Food is a sign of love. If you have a heavy heart, as Josh did from waking up early, you just need someone to hear your complaint. Someone to hear you. Not someone to give you some wonderful pontification, get up on his special chair and say, Woo! I know the answer, Josh. It's all about love coming to you. You don't need somebody on the chair. You need somebody who simply says, I, I hear you. That had to be really frustrating for you, Josh. That's what you need. And part of our visioning is trying to ask the question, what does the West End need? And what do we need from each other as we're leaning on each other, as we're finding hope on a Sunday morning? Or if we couldn't make it to church on Sunday morning, when we watch the, the video of the message or the video of the entire service, or we uh, listen to the podcast, what is it that we need that will carry us through the week that will help us to be love in the world? Because in the end, that's what we hope we'll be as a community and as individuals. Because you see, the church has really kind of a breathing motion. You know, when you think about that breathing motion, we breathe in, we breathe out, we breathe in. We practice this every week. Hopefully you practice it in between times also, like breathing. You know, for the entire 167 hours we're not together. I hope you're practicing that, because if you're not, I, I do a pretty good funeral. So, uh, you know, uh, but keep practicing, keep practicing. But the truth is, we breathe in and come together. We breathe in and we come together as a community to draw strength from one another, to draw love from one another. And then we breathe out into the whole world. Only it's not really us breathing out. And it's not really us breathing in. The spirit comes in. And the spirit flows out. And the spirit comes in. The breath of God comes in. What if you thought about every breath that you take as that first breath in the second creation story in Genesis when God breathes into Adam life? Every breath that you take in, imagine God is breathing life into you. And then you're breathing that back out into the world. You see, we are called as God's people to be that love right here, gathered in this space, scattered all over the city and the country and the world. And quite frankly, we have disparate 
people all over the place that watch us from all over the place. I get notes from people in Minneapolis and in Washington State and other kinds of folks who watch us online and make that connection with us. Hopefully, that's the spirit breathing out into this larger world. That is what grounds any vision that we come up with. Any plan we make for St. James about the future of who we are has to start in love. If it's not about love, then it's not about who God is. Now today, I want to, one of the pieces of what we're hoping to catch a vision for is not just, there are two kinds of change. There are probably more than two kinds of change, but there are two kinds of change that I have read about. One is technical change and one is adaptive change. I made a technical change today. That is to say, I normally wear a long sleeve black shirt and black jeans. Today, I chose to wear blue jeans and a short sleeve and quite frankly, I'm freezing to death in this space. I need my parka, I need my parka, but I decided that today I would make a simple technical change so you could see what a technical change looks like. It simply required me to put on a different pair of pants and a different shirt today. That's a technical change. If you don't like how bright the lights are, technical change would be for me to go back and touch the dimmer and dim it down a little bit. Or if you don't think it's bright enough in here, to dim it up some. Or if we're at the top of the dimmer, for me to bring in a couple of floodlights and just shine it on you, whatever. Those are technical changes. All they require is probably some money and some time, and you can flip those switches. But adaptive change requires we look at our hearts and that we look at the world around us and how can we bring transformation into it. Technical change is important, but it's often easy. Adaptive change is harder. Adaptive change is perhaps saying, you know, the way we did worship in the 50s, it was pretty cool for 50s. And I still go to 50s worship, and I kind of like 50s worship. But it, it, it doesn't work for some folks. And so what do we do? We do something different at St. James. We started doing something different. I, when I came to St. James in 1992, I had one kind of training and one kind of training only. I knew how to wear robes. I knew exactly what way to wear my stole. I knew exactly what way to stand and look appropriate. I've been taught exactly how to wave my hands over this so that it all magically becomes something. I was taught all that stuff. And then I went to this conference with some of the folks at St. James in 1993, and those crackheads and I said, maybe we should try contemporary worship. I am not trained to do this. I am not trained to stand in the middle of the aisle and talk to you like I'm talking to you. I'm supposed to have a fully printed out sermon that I have on the page that I read to you page for page for page as I turn. No, I should have read it enough times that I can turn the page without even looking at it. But that's what I'm trained to do. But that wasn't working. That wasn't attracting new people. It wasn't drawing people in. It wasn't speaking to the souls of people. So I stopped doing it. And it was frustrating for me because I was trained to do something. And I have all these really cool robes. <laughs> I have a black robe. I have a cream color robe. I have a white coated robe. I look totally cool in those with the cincture. I know how to tie it one handed. You know, I can just, I can be the coolest. Except now I wear St. James shirts. That is not as cool. Well, it is very cool, I know. But can you see that these are just some kinds of adaptive changes? And some things are really require us to look at ourselves and look at how we can reach people and how can we be loved in ways that are going to reach people in new ways. Used to be churches thought of themselves as all standalone. We are our own little group here. And yet we have found great benefit from partnering with other churches, with other groups, and being a part of what they're doing in our community. And it's weird because they're not all Methodists that we're partnering with. In fact, sometimes we send people to get Methodist training and they're like, I don't get this. <laughs> this isn't how we do it at St. James. It's how we're supposed to do it at St. James. Just learn it. <laughs> learn it. Come back, we'll do what we're supposed to do, however. Part of visioning is trying to start where you are and 
recognize that God is trying to pull you along into something God can only see. There's this wonderful hymn that we don't, it's a new hymn. And I can say new because it's in my lifetime. Uh, oftentimes, James says something is new, and I'm like, is it really new? I don't think that's new. Or it's old, and it's like from 2001. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get a cane soon. It's a, a, a poor James. I like to poke this a little fun. He, he appreciates that. But, the, but uh, the song is, in the bulb, there is a flower. In the seed, an apple tree. In cocoons, a hidden promise. Butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and dead of winter, there's a spring that waits to be. Un, unforeseen, unbe, unseen, until it's, you know, something God alone can see. Something God alone can see. Stephen and I could sing it together, but uh, I'm not subjecting you to me. Um, the, the truth is, there's something beautiful that God sees unfolding at St. James that, quite frankly, we're not always seeing because we're rushing from thing to thing to thing. If we can find a way to keep ourselves grounded in the love of God and slow down long enough, which is what this afternoon is supposed to be about, Slow down long enough to sit together with other people who may see exactly the same way we do or may see radically different than we do and ask the question, what do you feel God's doing here at St. James? What are you seeing? Because I see a lot of things, but you may see it from a whole other perspective. Before we came to worship today, we sat in, uh, in council meeting. Uh, the church council got together and we had breakfast. And Anne made these wonderful quiches and these delicious uh, pastries and things from scratch and we all ate them and talked. But one of the things that we didn't, I had not heard from a person, and I will call out poor Madison, our children's director, but she's relatively new to St. James. And she told me all the things that she had no idea about because she came here. Like for instance, what is she supposed to say when she gets communion? If she gets communion, is she supposed to say amen? In the Catholic Church, it's very clear. Someone's going to say to you, the body of Christ broken for you, and you are supposed to say amen, or they won't give it to you. You've got to say amen. You know, you've got to get it in there. <laughs> well, I don't ever tell you what to say. And, I don't t and when you go up to different people who are going to serve communion, every person says something different. This is the love of Christ, the cup of salvation. They say all these different things. What are you supposed to say? Am I supposed to say anything? Do I have to say something? Is there a rule? Well, there isn't a rule, but I'm going to start talking about that a little bit when I do the communion invitation, just so you don't feel uncomfortable. Madison wasn't sure. Poor Madison, she's not here to defend herself. But she was like, I'm a first timer. I thought that there was some kind of secret society of people who could serve communion. <laughs> because it, I don't know who decides who gets to do it. Well, we love anybody to do it, but if you don't know that we love anybody to do it, you might think, oh my gosh, they must only pick certain people. Usually it's a matter of convenience. Whoever is here at 11 o'clock and sitting down, so you notice some people don't come until 11.15, I think it's all about, I don't want to serve communion this week. <laughs> Linda's going to tap me. She's going to tap me, so I'm going to let somebody else go early this time. Let somebody else. Anybody can serve communion. Or, quite frankly, nobody could serve communion. That would really make it tough. That would make it tough. So clearly, that's one thing I've got to be better about. We've got to be better about communicating. People don't know. Somebody said to Madison recently, so she, they assumed that the whole jam session was going outside, and they just went outside and played. And how was it to play outside? They go and learn a whole lesson. You know, everyone who teaches jam spends time in preparation to go and sit with children so that they can learn something about God at their own level in the way they can hear it. Jam isn't going outside to play. Sometimes they study outside. Not today. <laughs> I forgot to arrange the weather before I came today. Sorry about that. But the truth is, who we are as a community needs to be clear 
at the very least, the least common denominator must be love. Everyone must be welcome even if they don't get what we're doing. And sometimes I do say to folks, and it's not in any way mean, I say to someone, if this isn't fitting for you, there are other churches you can go to. And it's okay. It's not, it's, we can't be all things to all people. We have to be who God has called us to be. And that's what visioning is about. Being sure we're moving in the direction that God wants us to move. That we're always grounded in love. That it's a love for neighbor because we realize the only way anybody will ever see God is if they embody love. God is love. The one who loves knows God. The one who doesn't love doesn't know God. So we've got to just keep loving. We've got to keep living in a world that invites us to love. But love can look so many different ways. It can look like the food pantry. It can look like the bounce house. That may not look that way to old, decrepit people like me, although I do crawl into the bounce house with the children. But to small children, that looks like God's love. <laughs> Bouncing everywhere. So we have to figure out how to communicate love on the west end of Alexandria and do it the best way God has empowered us to. And we want to equip you to do it. And we want to be sure we're doing it the way we, as a community of faith, are gifted to do it. And that God will stretch us to meet whatever crazy, audacious needs God has on the West End. And what's interesting is God will also do the same thing in your life. Stretch you to meet the needs of the people that you encounter at work or on the metro if you're open to letting the love flow through you. Beloved, let us love one another because love is of God. The one who loves knows God. The one who doesn't love does not know God. I'm convinced part of the challenge in the world is a lot of people don't know what love is. And they want us to show them. They want to feel what love is. <laughs> they want us to show them. How, I, I wanted to see if you were all awake. You were. It took a moment. <laughs> I had put you to sleep. Oh, he's talking about love again. We'll, we, he'll essentially say something eventually. Because I want to know what love is. And I want you to show 